Hello, everybody. Hello. Ralph Ellis, I don't know if you all know me. Um, thanks for the introduction there, Hugh. Uh, yes, this comes, this is my talk today, Eastern Megaliths and Microliths, because we're going to do a tour of Syria and the Levant, and we're going to look at the megaliths there, and we're going to finish off with a few of the microliths um, as well, because... I think they, have, uh, they come from the same era and the same provenance as the uh, megaliths. Just get my notes out here. So, Eastern Megaliths and Microliths by myself, Ralph Ellis. This comes from my King Jesus trilogy. Um, which is all from this region, of course. It started with um, Cleopatra to Christ, which um, traces the ancestry uh, of uh, Jesus. And we moved on, big 600-page opus, this one, um, King Jesus, and that, that gives us um, real historical events from the biblical stories. Uh, and that moved on to this one, Jesus, King of Edessa. This is quite pivotal, this, uh, this book. Um, this identifies the biblical Jesus in the historical record. So he was a real person, a real king, a king of Edessa. And we're going to look at Edessa later on because it has some uh, megaliths right next door to it. Um, so, yeah, interesting book that, again, 600 pages identifying Jesus in the historical record. But while I was doing this, I kept coming across little snippets of Arthurian legend because, I mean, who was the big hero of Arthurian legend? It was Joseph of Arimathea, who came from, obviously, this region. So the final book in this series, yeah, it's a trilogy in four parts, I know, but never mind. Um, the Grail Cipher, which rewrites all of Arthurian history in a very different fashion. Um, this is a Marmite book. You either hate it or you love it, one of the two. Nothing in between. Anyway, so let's move on. Let's have a look at some megaliths. So, not sure if you recognize this. This is obviously a megalith, and this comes from the Temple of Jerusalem. So, yes, the Jerusalem Temple is built on a foundation that is megalithic. Uh, and you can see from this picture... Uh, here's the megaliths down below. Here is the more recent architecture, the Roman architecture up above. So we have two distinct eras here. And uh, if you look at that megalith, does that sort of look familiar to you? Anyone that's been out to Egypt? Well, to me, it looks rather like this one. Where's that? We're back at Giza here. So have a look at these megaliths. Obviously, the second, uh, um, the second pyramid is actually based on an artificial platform. And it happens to be made of megaliths that look extremely like the ones that underpin the um, Jerusalem temple. So are we talking here the, the same era, the same designer? Uh, I think so, because we can find this all over the Near East. Um, so that's Giza. Let's jump back to Jerusalem. And this is, this is another megalith up in uh, Jerusalem. This is underpinning the Jerusalem temple there, the Temple of Solomon. Now have a look at this particular megalith. Um, I have an inkling that these holes are often used for actually lifting the stones in, into position. So have a look at this megalith and compare it with the next one. Okay, similar. Where are we now? We're up at Baalbek. Uh, if you know Baalbek, it's up in, in Lebanon, um, just to sort of the, uh, the west of Damascus. This is the Baalbek Temple, which was probably the largest temple complex in the Roman Empire. And as you can see, it is founded upon megaliths. And then we have the more recent architecture up above. So, yeah, we have 
a series of megaliths that all look the same in this particular region. So um, let's have a look at Baalbek then, because it's an interesting site. This is underneath the Baalbek temple. So now we can see that we have two eras here. There are two distinct eras. We have, so this tunnel is underneath Baalbek, the Baalbek temple platform. And we have here megaliths underneath, and we have Roman architecture up above. Now, we're not exactly sure why the Romans had to rebuild this. Obviously, the roof structure would have been megalithic. It would have been um, lintels uh, across the top. Perhaps it eroded away. Perhaps it was damaged by earthquakes. Who knows? But we don't know when it was damaged and why the Romans had to uh, rebuild it. But they did, and they put a Roman, standard Roman arch on the top. So we have two distinct eras. And the question then becomes, of course, when was the megalithic era? It's obviously pre-Roman, but when was that megalithic era? Well, you've probably seen people try to decide this by archaeoastronomy and things of that nature, but there's another way we can look at this, and that is by erosion. So if we can, if we can assume a standard rate of erosion on stones, we can have two different erosion rates, and we can maybe get a date from that. So here's a bit of erosion. You will see, this is um, uh, back at Giza again. This is uh, from the Great Pyramid of Giza. This is the, um, oh, it's all a bit white here, but never mind. This is the um, pavement upon which the uh, Great Pyramid rests. So we have two blocks of stone. We have a block of stone here, and we have a block of stone here, and we have this line running down the middle. Why is there a line there? Well, because originally the casing blocks came down here. So what we have then is we have this area was protected by the casing blocks, and this area was always being weathered by the sun, by the rain, by the feet of pilgrims, um, and it was being worn away over the millennia. And then someone came along during the Muslim era, and they... Um, they took away the casing blocks. They were all used for building uh, projects uh, down in Cairo. Um, and so now, both sides of this stone were exposed to the elements. And so here, we see there is less erosion because that has only been exposed for a 1,000 years. We know when these casing blocks were taken away. Uh, but this area has been exposed ever since the pyramid was built. The interesting thing is between here and here, this area on the left has 10 times as much erosion as the area on the right. So if this has been exposed for a 1,000 years, then we can probably say, if we can assume a standard erosion rate, that this area here has been exposed for 10,000 years. So as a rough guide, we can probably say that the Great Pyramid is about 10,000 years old, and therefore the megalithic era is probably about 10,000 years old. So it's rough and ready, but it's a good guide to how far back we're looking for the megalithic era. Um, so that is um, an estimate of the megalithic era. Let's go back to Baalbek then, where we were before. This is up in Lebanon. And have a look at some of the uh, architecture that's been built there. So this is the small um, temple at Baalbek. Actually, it's not that small, really. But anyway, we'll see in a minute. It's a vast temple. This is the temple of Aphrodite. It goes under several names, this particular temple. Um, but it's almost in as new condition, a little bit of TLC, and they could put this back into its original condition. But I say this is the small temple at uh, Baalbek, but you can't really get much idea of an idea of scale there. But if you look down the bottom here, that's a person. Yeah, it's huge. 
This is Roman, of course, it's not megalithic, but it is still a huge, huge temple. And the workmanship on here is absolutely amazing. This is looking up at the lintels, and you'll see every inch of the lintels has been carved on these uh, temples. Absolutely fantastic. Here is the um, capital, and it's not only very intricate, superb workmanship, but it's almost in as new condition. As I say, a bit of TLC, they could put this temple back into its original condition, but nobody much cares about the um, ancient world out there, unfortunately. Um, but this is not the biggest site. Sorry, not the biggest temple on the uh, Baalbek site. Uh, the biggest one is this one. This is the Temple of Jupiter, and this actually stands upon the Baalbek um, temple platform itself. And this is absolutely vast. Uh, again, not megalithic, this is Roman, but you might call this neo-megalithic because these columns are 19 meters tall. And they had to cut them into three drums. You can probably see one, two, three drums. Each of those drums weighs 70 kilos. Not bad in terms of architecture from 2,000 years ago. And these lintels on the top, I'm never quite sure if these lintels come in two pieces or one piece. Uh, but if it's uh, a single piece, it's around the 200 tons mark. It's a huge piece of stone on the top there. And again, you can't get a, an idea of scale there, really. Because when I went to Lebanon, obviously it's a bit of a dangerous place, <clears throat> there was no one else there. I was the only person on site for two days, apart from a party of Koreans that came wandering through for 40 minutes. The, the Korean tourists get everywhere. Um, but apart from that, I was on my own. So there's no sense of scale there. So here's a person for you. Oh, he's going very slow. We had to... Oh, he wasn't supposed to do that. Never mind. Um, we had to translate this from Apple into uh, PowerPoint, and it, it's not doing quite what I expected. Anyway, there is a person for you to give you an idea of scale. Um, these columns are 2.4 meters in diameter. They are simply huge. They are the largest columns made during the Roman era. Uh, well, we presume they are Roman columns. I mean, there's... There's no definitive answer on that, but uh, we, we think they're Roman. So it's a vast, vast temple built on a megalithic platform. As you can probably see, the megaliths are just underneath here. Uh, so it's Roman on top of megalith. And these, uh, let's have a look at the end of the temple platform. So this is the end of the platform. The temple of, Ju uh, of Jupiter is just up the top here, you can't see it, it's just out of sight. This is the end of the temple platform, and this is what people often come to Baalbek to have a look at. These are the Trilithon stones. One, two, three, uh, four, five, six huge megaliths. Um, and these stones are simply huge. Again, you can't get a sense of scale there because I was the only person, so I've nicked this, uh, I've nicked this image off the internet because it has a person there. Now you can get some idea of scale. So here's a person, and so this stone here has got to be something like three meters by three meters and about, oh, I don't know, about 15 meters long or so. We're talking about the 700 ton mark for this particular stone. Um, and you've got to wonder why on earth an architect would specify 700 ton stones in their building project. I mean, why not just cut it up uh, transport it in smaller amounts, glue it back together again with a bit of mortar, good as gold. I mean, we're not talking about a, a column here or a stella or, or something that needs to be in a single piece. It's just a temple platform. Why on earth would you want to make a temple platform of stones of this size? The only answer is that it was simple for the architect. Now, in what way it was simple, I will leave that up to you to speculate. But it had to be simple, otherwise they just simply would never have done it. Um, but these aren't even the biggest stones on the site. So uh, this one is larger. Here's me sitting on the top. 
Um, this is down the road. This is in a uh, quarry, so this stone hasn't been used. This is about two, three kilometers down the road, um, just opposite the Hotel Palmyra, uh, where I was staying. And this is the old quarry. This stone is about four by four by 20, I think it is. It's about 1,000 tons. It is a, um, simply a huge stone. Now, all of this area, uh, this was back in 2008, something like that, I think. This has all now been dug out. So I think when Hugh did his latest video, you could see that this has all been excavated, and you can see um, what was underneath. And that's um, very interesting as well. And it's known as the um, Stone of the Pregnant Woman. Uh, why is that? Because this stone is still attached to the ground. So it's sitting on a little plinth underneath. It was never quite separated from the ground. And that plinth is an umbilical, in effect. And so the pregnant woman is, is the earth herself. It is Gaia giving birth to this new stone, this little fetus stone stuck on top of this umbilical. And so she is the stone of the pregnant woman. Uh, and again, huge great stone, 1,000 tons, but that is not the biggest stone on this site. Uh, this one is, and not many people know about this stone, but anyway, this is a bit further down. This is another quarry. This is uh, another three kilometers down the road. And this is the Stone of the Colossus. And uh, there's me on the top again to give you an idea of scale. And I had, had some great fun trying to take this picture because obviously I was the only person there at the time. So all I could do is stick the um, camera on a tripod, uh, press the timer, which only had 10 seconds was the maximum I had, <laughs> and then run down to the bottom here. So I had, I had 15 pictures of me falling over on the stone. <laughs> and then finally, the, the 16th picture is me in pose mode at the end. Um, yeah, so there's me. This stone is even bigger. This is four and a half meters by four and a half meters by about 24 meters long. This stone uh, comes in at about 1,200 or 1,300 tons. And again, you've got to wonder, why on earth would you want to specify a stone of this size for your building project? It's absolutely crazy. And in fact, it's so crazy that the Romans, can you see at the end here, the Romans turned the stone into a quarry because it was too large for them to carry and there was no point carrying it, so they actually started quarrying the end of it and take, taking blocks of stone out of it. Um, yeah, this is the megalithic era, which, as I say, is probably in the realms of 10,000 years ago. Um, and so let's have a look at the temple platform itself. This is Baalbek. This is not the Temple of Jupiter. This is the, as it were, the antechamber of the temple. So this is a panoramic, and it runs around the whole of the, um, the front end of the temple platform. So the Temple of Jupiter is behind us. And look at the vastness of this construction, the amount of architecture. We tend to think that we live in a rich world. Think of how rich the Roman Empire must have been in order to create this enormous great structure. Huge, isn't it? But why was it destroyed? Why is it in the condition we see it in today? Well, sometimes the detail gives you the answer, not the big picture. It's the detail we need to look at. So let's have a look at this again. Let's run the same panorama again. And what are these stones up the top? As we go around, you'll see more of them. Here we go. We've got battlements on the top. Why on earth have we got battlements on the top of a temple? The sad truth is it was the Romans themselves who destroyed the temple. Um, these battlements were caused during the 8th century, uh, during the Saracen Muslim invasions. And 
the Roman Empire had been at peace with itself for hundreds of years. Uh, because it was so powerful, so mighty, very few of its towns and cities actually had city walls. So they were defenseless. And during the uh, Saracen Muslim invasions, all they could do was tear down their own temples and turn them into fortresses. And we see this all over um, the Near East. Here is another one. This is Spitla. This is in North Africa, this one, actually. And you can see, again, in Spitla, they tore down their own city to make this defensive wall. You can see this very rough and ready defensive wall that they made around their city. But to no avail, because they were um, all exiled from their city. Here's another one. This is uh, Didyma, wonderful site if you get out to the, this one is in um, Anatolia. So if you get out to Anatolia, this is a wonderful temple, huge great temple. It took them something like 400 years to build this temple. Uh, and then they tore it all down so they could build this wall all the way around it. You can see this wall goes all the way around the temple area. Um, very traumatic era, that era. And the same happened in Syria. So in our great tour of Syria, wonderful sights these. If you ever get out to Syria, um, can't do it nowadays, of course. It's a bit too dangerous. But if you get out to Syria, uh, these cities are marvelous places to go and visit. These are the dead cities of Aleppo. And um, it's like Toy Town, really, isn't it? It's great. Uh, these, around Aleppo, which is in northern Syria, there are 800 towns, cities, and settlements that were destroyed uh, during the 8th century, during the Sar Saracen invasions. And they're just standing there. So we have complete cities without the people. So this is a um, basilica, a cathedral. Remember, all of this area was, uh, was Christian at this time, all of North Africa. All of Anatolia was all Christian. And they've left these basilicas all over the Near East. And you can, you can wander around these cities. You can walk down their high streets. You can go into their shops. You can go into their cathedrals. And they're just sitting there. And they've been abandoned for 1,300 years, just sitting there out in Syria. Here's another basilica, huge great basilica, just, just as it was left over 1,000 years ago. Very interesting places. And there are so many of those cities to visit out in Syria. One of the interesting things, though, we see there in amongst these dead cities is these... Um, these mausoleums. So we have these uh, pyramid tombs. So now, obviously this was a Christian land at the time, but now we're invoking the history and the culture of Egypt. And some of them are quite huge. This is a, a vast mausoleum, again invoking the uh, history of Egypt. But interestingly, the actual tomb itself is Christian. So if we look inside it, and here's the inside, you'll see three sarcophagi, and here you will note the chiro of Christianity. So these are Christian tombs. But more confusing than that, if you look at the top, you'll see that the top of the sarcophagus has the four horns of the Judaic altar. So we have a fusion here between Egypt, Judaism, and Christianity. So we can pretty much say that these tombs belong to the Nazarene, the Ebionites, the Church of Jesus and James, the slightly Egyptian uh, form of Judaism that was present in the first to the fifth centuries out here. Um, so while we're looking at it, this is just some of the sites of Syria. So would, you know, as soon as they stop fighting out there, I would really recommend anyone going out there because 
Syria, well, if you look at it today, obviously a bit downtrodden, you would never believe that it was a rich culture. But during this era, this is anywhere from you know, the second century BC through to the sixth century AD, Syria was the richest part, the richest region of the Roman Empire. And so as you go around, it's many, many sites. You'll see places like this. This is Apamea, which is a whole forest of these enormous great uh, pillars all the way through this town. And look at uh, this. This is the main road into town, as it were. And look at this huge, wide road um, for your carts going into this huge, great town. Wonderful sights to see. Um, here's an interesting one. This is Palmyra. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Palmyra, but it's a, quite a, a famous city out in the eastern Syrian desert. And uh, this is the Temple of Bel. And this is one of the last pictures of the Temple of Bel because this was all blown up by ISIS a few years ago. So it doesn't exist anymore. It's all gone, which is a real shame because um, the... Temple of Bel was probably the richest uh, temple within the Roman Empire. Not the largest, that was the, um, the Temple of Jupiter, but probably the richest. And you'll see this from the top of the pillars here. I'm not finished, they're unfinished. That's because the capitals on these pillars were made of bronze. Now, bronze was really expensive in this era. So, you know, to use bronze as a top for your capitals on your pillars was hugely extravagant. This was a really, really wealthy um, temple. And it has the largest temple courtyard uh, that I've ever seen, probably in the whole of the Roman Empire. It had this enormous colonnade that went all the way around the temple. And you could walk around the top of the colonnade on top of its roof. But to get on, on top of the colonnade, to get on the roof, they had pillars in each corner, which were so large that they had a spiral staircase that went up the middle of the pillar. Excellent. It's really, really good architecture. So probably still worth, well worth seeing, even though they've managed to destroy the Temple of um, Bel. But a very interesting site nonetheless. And um, here's another one. This huge, great, oh, okay. Ah, it has done it. Okay. This huge, great cathedral in Rasafa. Except it's not a cathedral. Anyone guess what it is without looking at the uh, legend? Um, this is out in the desert. This is what you do if you live in a desert region. Quite often you'll see people on the te television complaining that they live in an arid condition and they're short of water and life is tough. This is what you do if you live in an arid place, because this is a water system. So this is all underground. Uh, only the top pokes above ground. And there are two of these side by side in the center of the city of Rasafa, out in the eastern Syrian desert. And just to give you a, an idea of scale, that's a person. And this will be full of water. Uh, during the uh, winter rains to last the city during the uh, hot summer months. Two of these side by side. Absolutely fantastic engineering. And um, the last little thing I want to look at in this little tour of Syria is this one. This is supposed to be a Phoenician tomb or sarcophagus. But if you know anything about the Phoenicians, they normally copy Egyptian styles, and their workmanship is quite rough and rude. And yet here, we suddenly have this Greek sarcophagus, which happens to be the finest piece of sculpture in the Greek world. And it's supposed to be Phoenician? No, I don't think so. So who does this belong to? Well, I think the clue is... Um, You'll probably recognize this, I don't know. Alexander the Great. So here's Alexander, and here's Darius III in their famous battle from the uh, third, fourth century 
BC. I think that this is the tomb of Alexander the Great. Um, we know that his tomb was created in Persia, uh, probably in Persopolis or somewhere like that, and it was taken uh, westwards on a huge great cart uh, to go to Greece, but it never arrived in Greece, and we don't know what happened to it. I have a suspi suspicion that it, it stopped here in Lebanon, and it was dropped off because it was a political hot potato. Nobody actually wanted to have his sarcophagus. And so it was dropped off in Lebanon, and it's been there ever since. And I think this is it. And if you want to see it now, you have to go to the um, museum in Constantinople, uh, Istanbul, because that's where it is now. Um, so where are we on this? So, ah, yes, megaliths. We were talking about megaliths, weren't we? So they do have megaliths in Syria, and you probably recognize this one. This is Gobekli Tepe, which is supposed to be the oldest temple complex in the world, um, and the oldest megalithic architecture, of course. And this one dates from about 11,000 years ago. So we're talking, really, the megalithic era that we identified before. So this is a, an amazing complex. There are loads of these circles. I don't know how many there are. There are probably eight, ten of these uh, circles all in one location. And they were all covered up with earth at some point, so nobody knew they were there. And they were uncovered only recently within the last 20 years or so. Uh, I won't talk too much about this because I'm sure you've all seen Gobekli Tepe. The thing that interested me is when we started this uh, talk, you'll notice I had the book Jesus King of Edessa. Uh, where is Gobekli Tepe? It's at Edessa. Uh, not sure if there is a connection there, but it's funny enough, it's right at Edessa. So, Here's a map of the region. We've got um, Jerusalem down the bottom, Damascus, Palmyra, uh, Aleppo is about there, Antioch, which is uh, modern Antakya. And there we go, there's Odessa. It's just beyond the Euphrates, which is a, a phrase I use time and time and time again in my books because it comes out of Josephus Flavius, the people from beyond the Euphrates, the people from Edessa. Very famous place. Well, it is in my books, anyway. Nobody knew about Odessa before I started writing about it because it's been deleted from history. You can do a, uh, a computer search of Josephus Flavius, the great historian of this region, and you can search for Odessa, and it will just say, uh-uh, nothing found, because it's been deleted from history. But here it is in the modern world. Here is Odessa. They call it San Lurfa now, but this is Odessa. So this is looking up at the citadel. That's where the old castle used to be many, many years ago. Uh, and if you go to Gobekli Tepe, you must go to Odessa because the museum is there. And luckily, they've built a, a nice new museum because the old one was uh, fairly carp. Um, but the new one is really good, so do have a look at that. And if you go to Odessa, do go to Sogmatar. Sogmatar is the necropolis of the Edessan monarchy. And it is a really ethereal, atmospheric place. It's about, uh, I don't know, it's about 50 kilometers, I think, towards the southeast of Edessa, out in the rolling desert hills that they have out there. And this is Sogmatar. Oh, no, it was just on a go slow. Here we go. And this is the central feature in uh, Sogmatar, which is a man-made hill. And we don't quite know how old this particular hill is, but I thought this hill was interesting, and I've just given the game away, haven't I? Because it's exactly the same size as Silbury, which is just down the road from us. Um, why were people making these... Um, these mounds, these conical mounds. Well, we're going to look at a lot of conical mounds um, later in this lecture. It's because, in my view, if you couldn't build a pyramid, 
because pyramids are big, expensive, they're megalithic, take an awful long time to make. Well, if you can't build something that grand, you can certainly build an earthen mound. And I think a lot of these conical mounds, and we're going to see many more of these, are cheaper representations of a pyramid. And that's why they built them. So going back to Sogmatar again, this is the um, mausoleum of the Edessan kings, the ne necropolis of the Edessan kings. These are the tombs that they buried their kings in. And there's about, I don't know, eight, to eight or ten of these scattered on these little tiny hills all the way across Sogmatar. And they are truncated round towers. So these are from the first century onwards. So these are sort of Roman era. And what are they? Again, I think they are imitation pyramids. If you had been um, initiated into the secrets of the Giza Plateau, you would know that the Great Pyramid is 2 pi r. The Great Pyramid is a circle, mathematically speaking. So if you wanted to show that you were initiated into the secrets of Giza, then you didn't have to build yourself a pyramid. You could build yourself a circle. And we see this um, analogy throughout the biblical text as well. I write quite a lot about this in my books. So to me, this is a pseudo-pyramid by someone who has been initiated into the secrets of Giza. And you can see the shaft that goes down the bottom here down into the um, tomb chamber underneath this particular round tower. And here's a picture inside it. So this is the entrance to the tomb. This on the left is the recess for a rolling stone. So it had a biblical style rolling stone that covered the entrance. And up here, there's a little bit of a ramp uh, ingeniously created so that you have to push the stone up the ramp and chock it with, you know, a wooden chock or something. And then when you finished inside, you pull the wooden chock out and the rolling stone rolls itself into place. All very ingenious. And here's looking into the tomb. Now, these are standard Judaic tombs that you find all over the Near East. Um, there's one down the Tomb of the Kings in Jerusalem is exactly the same. There's one actually at Baalbek that they uncovered um, where the stones were. Um, and these are not, they're not actually tombs as such. These are more like uh, sarcophagi. These are body eaters. So what you do is you put your body in one of these little alcoves here and you leave it there to rot away. For a few years, I don't know how long it takes. I've never tried it myself, but there we go. Um, give it three or four years. I don't know how long it takes. And the body rots away, and you're left with a pile of bones. And then you can collect up the bones, put the bones into an ossuary, and you can put the ossuary into your cellar. One presumes that when the body has, has gone, therefore the soul has departed and therefore all you're left with is bones and you can put those anywhere you like and your, your body has, has, has dissipated in a very ethereal location called Sogmatar all the way out in the uh, eastern desert away from Edessa. Very interesting site but we saw there that there was a, um, a conical mound at Sogmatar. There are loads of these and there's, here's another one. This I'm not sure if you recognize this. This is Tekoa. This is, um, or Herodium, I think they call it. Uh, this is just to the south of Jerusalem. And it's said to be man-made, but it's not actually. It's, it's a natural mesa, a natural hill, that has been modified by someone to make it into a conical hill. So it has um, artificial sides put on the side of it to make it into a conical hill. Why have they done that? Because they want to make it look like a pyramid. Same as the uh, previous mound we saw, it's an imitation pyramid. It's an imitation primeval mound. Um, and this was used by the Herodian kings. They built a castle on top of it. 
but originally it would have been a, a, a temple complex. And uh, here's another one. This is very unknown, this one. Um, but if you happen to be in Syria, this is the temple of Shmemis. Um, this is actually a volcano. So we have an old volcano here, and someone has coated the sides with it with a bit more material to make it again into a conical hill, a primeval mound. And they put a temple on the top of it um, because it was an imitation pyramid. Not everybody could build in megalithic architecture, and so they made their own one here. Very interesting site. It's just outside uh, Homs and Hammer, down in the south of uh, Syria. And um, talking of sacred hills, uh, does anyone recognize this one? This is down on the Dead Sea. Um, and it's a, a fortress and a temple complex uh, known as Masada. For those of you who don't know Masada, it's very famous in Judaic history. Um, they had the Jewish revolt uh, of AD 66 to AD 70 uh, when there was a re revolt against Rome. But the revolt failed, of course. Well, it always does against Rome. You know, they were so powerful. The revolt failed, and so the rebels all disappeared off, and they were holed up here on the top of Masada, where there was a great fortress on the top of Masada. And they were surrounded by Romans for three years. And rather than surrender, they all committed suicide. Very, very famous story within Judaic history. But does anyone recognize that from modern theater, from modern films, modern Hollywood? It is the fortress of Jeddah. Is it going to write something? It's on a go slow, this thing. There we go, Fortress of Jeddah. And if you change the E to a U, you get the Fortress of Judah. Um, it is the same fortress. So let, let's put the um, battle cruiser back on Masada. And here you have the Fortress of Masada. It's been used in a film, but you might say, well, hold on a minute. Any old hill that's got a flat top is going to look like Jeddah, isn't it? Um, so it's, it's merely a coincidence. Well, no, I don't think so, because if we take a, a, an aerial look at Jeddah, we will see that it looks like this. So this is the fortress of Jeddah from Star Wars, and you'll see that it is a, it's a freestanding fortress that juts out of this desert environment uh, with these sheer cliffs on either side. And it's almond shape, diamond shape. And look behind and you'll see all of these cliffs with their strata, horizontal strata on these cliffs behind. Yeah, that's from Star Wars. Now let's have a look at Masada. And it's a freestanding, almond-shaped, diamond-shaped uh, fortress that juts out with these vertical cliffs on either side. And look at the strata on the cliffs behind. They've used Masada as a template for the Star Wars trilogy, the original Star Wars trilogy. Why have they done so? Because it's telling the same story. The story of Star Wars is the story of the Jewish revolt. So um, the evil galactic empire is the evil Roman empire that was governing this region. The plucky rebels that are fighting against the galactic empire were the plucky Nazarene and Ibionite Judaic rebels who were fighting against the Roman empire. Empire. It is the same story. And you can imagine these rebels holed up in their caves on the shores of the um, uh, Dead Sea or perhaps on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Oh. 
we have some Jedis. So yeah, the, the Essene monks who used to tour um, Judea wearing nothing but a cloak and carrying a sword because they always carried a sword are the, the Jedi monks who toured the galaxy um, wearing nothing but a cloak and carrying a lightsaber. They are the same. So we can imagine these rebel monks holed up in their caves uh, along the Dead Sea or along the Sea of Galilee, muttering about the Romans. and asking, what did the Romans <laughs> ever do for us? And well, I mean, they, they, they could have mentioned the aqueducts and the sanitation and the baths and the roads, yeah, but the roads go without saying. So you can see how these ancient stories have been reworked uh, within modern literature, modern film work. Uh, modern Hollywood, and we're going to see that again just in a minute because we now move on to the microliths. And why do we want to look at the microliths? Well, because they are part and parcel of the same story. They came out of the megalithic era, and the original microlith came from Egypt. It's this one. This is the primeval mound upon which the phoenix stood sometimes known as the Benben, and it was this sacred mound. This is why we get these imitation mounds all over uh, the Near East. This is why we get the pyramids, because the pyramids are imitation primeval mounds themselves. So we have this primeval mound upon which the phoenix stood, and the phoenix is a, a sunbird. You can see the sunburst behind his head. Um, so this sacred mound um, comes out of prehistory, out of the very early Egyptian era. And sometimes it's cast as being very big, sometimes it was only small. And when the, this was known as the Benben. I don't know sure if you've heard of the Benben stone, but anyway, it used to be from Heliopolis in Egypt. But during the Greek era, it ended up in Greece. And here it is in Greece. This is known as the Omphalos. And this is what it sort of looked like. It was a conical stone. Uh, not very big. It was only supposed to be about 70, 80 centimeters high. What's that? About two foot six. It's quite smallish. And here you see it draped with various um, netting. We're not quite sure what this netting was, whether it was just decorative or part of the stone. Not really sure why it had that on it. But this is the Omphalos at Delphi. So if you go to Delphi uh, in... Uh, Greece, you will see it there today. But this is not the original, of course. This is just a copy. This is a, uh, a copy made in marble. Um, here's an image of the original. Okay, this is a coin from Persia. Uh, this is a coin from Persia when Persia was Greek. Remember, all of Iraq and uh, Iran and all of that region was all Greek at this time. And that's why the legend here is in Greek. And it says... Seleukoi, it's the Seleucid era of Greece, uh, of Persian Greece. And here you will see Apollo sitting on the sacred Omphala stone, the same stone that came out of Egypt. And you can see it is again draped with this netting. I'm not sure why the netting is there, but there we go. So it was a seat. It was a seat for the gods who sat on it. Um, here is another image of the same stone, again from Persia, Greek Persia. But it didn't stay in Persia. So it's been on a bit of a, a tour so far. It came out of Egypt. It ended up in Greece. It's gone across to Persia. It didn't stay in Persia. It came back from Persia, courtesy of Queen Theomusa Aurania, again, another of these unknown monarchs that nobody knows about. She was a Persian queen, and she was evicted from Persia, and she ended up in Edessa, that wonderful place. We're going to see Edessa in a minute. Um, and she, I think, she took the stone with her. So here is the stone. Here is an actual image of the stone uh, in Edessa. And here it is. You can see the conical stone. 
except you're going to say, well, that's not very conical, is it? Um, so here it is, and this is actually a Bethel. A Bethel is a house of God. Um, but this is not a big house. This is a very small house. Um, it's just a box, a box that contained the sacred stone. So the sacred stone is inside the box. It's inside the Bethel. And you all know what this is. Not sure if you recognize it. Lots of people have been hunting for it. It is the Ark of the Covenant. So here we have an image of the Ark of the Covenant from, uh, I think it was about the second, third century AD in Edessa. This is why the Edessa monarchy was so important, because they owned the Ark of the Covenant. I think we need a, a few chords of the tune, don't we? Da, 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 da. But it didn't stay there. So the Edessa monarchy came to an end really in the third century and the stone moved down to Syria. And here is the stone in Syria. And now we can see it's a, it's a conical stone again. So here it is in a temple conical stone, and you can see on it, it's embossed with the image of the phoenix. We can see the phoenix once more. Why did it have the phoenix on it? Because it was supposed to be a meteorite. So it came in through the skies in this great fiery fireball. And remember, the phoenix is the uh, fiery bird who came down from the heavens above. Um, and so this was a sacred meteorite, which have been all over the Near East over the last, well, we don't know how long, 10,000 years or so. Uh, but it didn't stay in Syria for very long either. It was taken to Rome. And here it is in Rome. And uh, you, you will see now, it's, it's, I forgot to mention, it's got a new name now, of course. It's called the El Gabal which means the mountain of God. And of course, it is a, it's a small mountain, isn't it? It's a small conical hill. That's why we have all of those conical hills that we saw earlier uh, around Syria. And you can see, again, it's embossed with the image of the phoenix sitting on there. Now, it was taken, this stone was taken to Rome by Emperor Elagabalus. Now, you've probably not heard of him either, but he was a third century emperor of Rome who came from Syria. That's why he had the stone. And he was a high priest of the Elagabal stone, this stone. In other words, he was, he was, a, um, he followed on from the footsteps of the biblical Jesus. Remember, Jesus his primary disciple was called Simon. But Simon was given the title of Peter Kephas, the stone. Why was he given that, that title? It wasn't because, uh, you know, upon this rock uh, my kingdom will be uh, created. It was because Peter was the keeper of the sacred stone. That's why he got the name Peter Kephas, because he was the keeper of of the sacred stone. Um, so this stone has gone all the way through history. And, but from Rome, when Emperor Elagabalus was, was murdered, we don't know what happened to it. But it does appear within history. It appears uh, once more within Arthurian legend. This is one of the reasons I got interested in Arthurian legend and started writing a story about Arthur as well. Because in Arthurian legend, this stone is called the Lapsit Elixis, the stone that came from heaven. But it has a more common name within Arthurian legend, and you'll know that as well, except you won't guess it from looking at this, but you all know exactly what this stone is. Because in Arthurian legend, it's called the Holy Grail. So here is the Holy Grail. So we found both now. We found the Ark of the Covenant, and now we found the Holy Grail. 
That definitely needs a few chords from uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, doesn't it? The Holy Grail is a multifaceted item. And if you read my books, you'll see exactly what it means. But it has many facets. It is a bloodline. It is a cup. But the cup is just um, a play on words for the bloodline. But it is also, within Arthurian legend, it is a sacred stone. And here is the sacred stone that has gone through history. Except it's gone missing. It's gone missing. Well, we know about it from Arthurian legend, but it's gone missing essentially for about 1,700 years. But it did appear in a film recently, and I nearly sort of fell off my chair when I saw it, because I'd be one of the few people who would actually recognize what this was. And why it appeared in this film, I've got no idea at all. But it's a very famous film. You all have seen it, but you won't have noticed what it was actually displaying. So what it was actually displaying is this stone. But you've got to imagine what this stone would look like. So this is a meteor. And this is what meteors look like. OK, this is the Williamette meteor from America. And you can see it's come through the atmosphere as a great fiery ball and landed on Earth. And, and therefore, it's all blackened and slightly reddish and full of the, all these little pockmarks because it got so hot during its descent to Earth. So that's what a meteorite looks like. So you have to imagine that this conical stone looked like that, blackened with... Um, with pieces missing off it, pockmarked. And also, it might, if you take it out of its uh, foundations, out of its holder, it might actually be egg-shaped. A bit like the lingams. If you've seen the lingams of India, and they have these phallic sort of <coughs> conical stones, the lingams, well, if you take a lingam out of its holder, it is actually an egg. So the phallic cone, when you take it out, is actually an egg. It's a, uh, it's a synthesis of the, of, of the male and the female in one artifact. And I've got a suspicion that the Elagabal stone, the Omphala stone, was probably the same. Anyway, so you can imagine, I was sitting in the cinema watching this film, and suddenly up comes an image of the Yellow Cabal stone. And here it is. I don't know if you recognize that. That's from James Bond in one of the latest movies. And for no apparent reason, because it, it, it had no relationship whatsoever to the subject of the film, suddenly we saw a picture of the Yellow Cabal stone. So somebody is still interested in the... Uh, uh, the origins and the um, location of the Elagabal stone. And so, on that little bombshell, 007's Holy Grail, that is the end. And I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>